we're get, we're getting closer and closer to having you know many people with a global understanding of biomechanics, but we're getting away from the most important attribute in sport performance, and that is strength. Hey, this is More Than Velocity. I'm Bart Pear here with Jordan Oseguera and Ryan Croton. And today we've got a lot of interesting stuff that I'm excited to talk about. Um, if you're watching this first, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, definitely hit the like and subscribe button. That'll make sure you get all of our content when it comes out. If you're, watch, if you're listening to the podcast, um, please subscribe. That'll keep you, um, keep you up to date, like I said, as new podcasts come out. We try to do one um, every week, but you'll know as soon as it hits live. So please do that. Today, we're going to talk about um, acute and chronic changes uh, with the arm uh, during outings, after outings, um, over the course of the whole season, changes in strength, change in range of motion, what's actually happening with the arm during an outing, um, why this matters, why we track it or give you the ability to track it with the Arm Care app, and what we're looking for, and how this can Im impact your training, um, you know, and how you can Im actually impact your performance and recovery and everything going in there. So we're going to try and hit on all of that um, in this podcast. We may have to split this up into two, um, depending, but uh, we're just going to, you know, just flood you guys with good information and uh, and just see where it goes. So first, I want to start just with, with what is acute and chronic changes in strength and range of motion when it comes to the pitching arm. I just want, uh, you know, just everybody to be on the same page to understand that background of what we're talking about. Um, so uh, why don't, Ryan, you just take off and, and take that and, and let's set that up first. Sure. So I think it's important to understand the the strength movements and motions that get, uh, that's been evaluated, at least in research. So we have internal rotation, which is the arm rotating forward in the direction of the throw. So we look at the internal rotator's strength. And then we have external rotation, which looks at the arm where it moves back into layback, and we're looking at external rotation strength. And then there's another um, strength measure called scaption, and it's essentially looking at the strength when you elevate your arm over your shoulder, you know, moving your arm up. And so what's been seen over the course of seasons is that strength depreciates and actually all three of those um, where they've actually seen some injury detection, you know, based on those. And they're very small percentages. So if you even have like a 10 percent, 10 to 13 percent decrease in strength, um, it, it can be a recipe for for injury over the chronic uh stages so that's over the course of a season so let's just give an example if an athlete let's just say it's internal rotator cuff strength so usually we're strongest in that position and they achieve uh, a 40 pound strength measure in preseason, where they're looking at these at different time points if they lose four to five pounds it could expose them to risk um, and there's been some studies too that look at uh, Tommy John surgeries, so athletes with elbow injuries uh, related to these measures, and they've seen that one of them that's, that's highly predictive is this scaption strength um, being a 13% loss, uh, moving the arm up against resistance. So those are, those are three important qualities. And when we talk about acute, usually when throwing, you're going to see a decline uh, immediately in both internal and external rotation. And that's just because you're throwing repetitively, especially for starters. Um, and it's challenging both the muscles that accelerate the arm forward, which is your internal rotators, and then the muscles that decelerate, which is the back of the shoulder being the external rotators. So you're going to see a decrease in strength there. However, in some athletes, you may see an increase in strength. So that's not unusual. Some athletes do get potentiated as well. And potentiation means that it increases force you know, after doing some, some loaded movement, such as throwing. So for the, the dummy in the group, I'm just going to clarify and you, you, you let me know if I've got this correct. So when we're talking about acute changes um, in strength, we're talking about changes from before and after a game, before and after a bullpen, before and after you do a velocity program where you're throwing weighted balls as hard as you can, we actually expect to see changes in strength 
from right before and after. That's what we consider acute. And then chronic, we also expect to see changes in those same metrics as the season goes on. So, you know, from preseason to the end of the season or, you know, a month later or whatever we want to de determine as chronic, um, that's your long-term changes, correct? Yep. Okay. Exactly. And you set up strength, and we expect to see changes there, but there's also changes uh, we expect to see in range of motion. You want to go yep. through those? Yeah. So in range of motion, you're going to see um, internal rotation deficit. So it means that your arm rotating forward is going to be less. And uh, that happens acutely um, because we have you know a lot of tension that's built in the posterior capsule or the capsule of the shoulder at the back. Uh, and over the course of the season, usually what happens is you're gaining layback. So you're gaining your, your range of motion, putting the arm behind you and rotating in an external position. And you're losing internal rotation that we said. And um, there has been some research to show there's some, some injury risk there, uh, particularly if there's a 25% difference or 25 degree difference, sorry, between your internal rotation on your throwing side and your non-throwing side. So that means that your non-throwing side has 25% or 25 degrees more internal rotation. Um, so that's been considered a, a, a change. You know, athletes get restrictions also overhead. So, you know, we want to be able to get 180 degrees when you're bringing your arm up overhead. And sometimes you get, you know, your lat in the, your pecs, those things get tight and it restricts your motion overhead. And that's been shown to see if you, if you've got a more than a five degree difference. So if your non-throwing side has five, more than five degrees, more um, range of motion going over your head, that exposes you to some risk. Um, and, and that's a problem, you know, when the, when the arm loses strength and when the arm loses range of motion, um, you're, you're definitely going to compensate in the way you throw. And we've talked about it before. The compensations are what can increase loading on the arm and, and lead to injury. And so these changes in range of motion, we expect to see them um, in just a single outing. We expect to see changes or is this a chronic yep. thing as well? Yeah. So it's both chronic. So, so the changes in an acute sense, um, there's been studies that show that it takes four days to restore your range of motion internally. Um, and usually it's internal rotation that, that gets affected. So it takes about four days to have it restore. And so, with, you know, some studies have shown that the sleeper stretch, it's a type of stretch where, you know, you're basically pinning down the shoulder blade and you're rotating your arm forward while lying on a surface on the ground, on your side um, or a table has been able to restore it in two to three days. So they've been able to make improvements there. Um, and athletes that don't really have a range of motion restoration type of approach, um, we could see more significant effects that are chronic. So, you know, it's important. That's why we are, we're measuring strength and range of motion all the time. So, and, and we, we can go in a number of different directions here. I know we want to get into what's actually causing all of this and what's going on with blood supply in the arm and stuff. But let's just talk about... Um, you talked about a loss of 10% or a loss of 13%. Um, where are we getting those numbers and how do we know what's acceptable and what's not? Yeah. So, you know, basically with the app, we're, we're building in a safety that we want the athlete to, to be above 10%. When they lose 10% or more of, of strength loss, it triggers some of our fatigue flags where we have uh, watch, warning, and medical. Um, and we also allocate them to a, to a weight to make it a little easier. So, you know, when we're looking at an individual muscle, um, we, we don't want to lose more than five pounds because uh, that will trigger a watch. And we need to then monitor and, and be able to evaluate changes in their throwing program that happen after that. Um, and then a warning, if, if we get more than eight pounds of strength loss and particularly, you know, that day, that week, we, we may want to look at um, managing a pitching outing, potentially not having them come out to pitch and get them more recovery. And then we're seeing losses like 12 pounds, something like that. Um, that could be something medical. So 
you know, in that sorry, that that goes along in the fresh test. We 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 measure that, but when we look at the percent fresh, we want to be at around ninety percent retained strength for everything. You so know, we don't just, want to get there. Just to clarify, so a fresh a fresh test or a fresh exam is something you do pre outing when you're basically at your, in your optimal state, you're ready to play, you know, high performance, and we want to see what you're capable of. And then after the outing, we're doing a, a post outing exam where we're comparing those changes and we're actually giving you a number called a percent fresh, which shows how much your strength has dropped off or your range of motion or wherever, whatever we're looking at, um, how that compares to what you were before. That's percent, yep. percent fresh, correct? Okay. Yeah, and I think this, this will be a good time to kick it over to Jordan because he's the pitching guy. You know, what you would be doing when you're seeing an athlete, you know, that that's below that 90% of retained strength. So they've lost more than 10%. Yeah, this is uh, this is something I obviously like talking about because this is where you can get really, really personalized and in the weeds with what you're doing with the guy on his programming. Um, one of my biggest recommendations is that guys use the fresh test when they're first starting out in the offseason for their throwing. So you get their you get their fresh test, they do their throwing program, and you find out what their percent fresh is after that. So if they're losing, you know, you're, you're like Ryan was talking about that eight pounds of strength or even more, that's way too much of a throwing program for that individual on that day. But if they're gaining strength, and this is something I wanted to kick over to Ryan as well for a little more depth, is you said some guys will find a strength gain just from a throwing program, right? So yeah, it's possible. in theory, now if you really start varying time, distance, intensity, you may find that optimal pregame throwing program for what each individual pitcher should be doing, right? So mm-hmm. in theory, you could be looking into that. So that's another way you can be using this as well is, you know, I, I just had a great conversation with a guy today who wants to get, you know, the whole thing rolled out for his guys. And he was asking about the percent fresh test because it's something he's been doing on his own. He bought the system, wanted to try it out. And he goes, so I've been rolling out these blanket programs. And he goes, and this is what I've noticed in his you know, 15, 20 years of coaching, whatever it's been, is he goes, 50% of my guys are dead on. He goes, 25% aren't challenged, and 25% can't throw the next day. He goes, will the percent fresh test help me to dial this in? 100%. It's going to help you dial it in. It's not going to be perfect. Just because there's always going to be a learning curve, maybe someone didn't sleep as well as you wanted them to, but it's going to take that 50%, and if you push that to 65, 75, or even, you know, maybe you get 90% success rate out of that, all of a sudden you're changing the way you develop your players just off the fresh test use right there. And that's the way I like to use it, is number one, if you get them right in the offseason, if you teach them how to use that to know, hey, I have to throw less tomorrow, or I am not throwing enough, or I'm right in that pocket, right where I need to be throwing, I'm in my sweet spot, now you can really run with this thing. And you can really dial in throwing programs. And I've said it before, I don't believe that that there's overtraining. <clears throat> I believe there's under-recovering. And what you do is you take this information, you find out who did too much throwing, who didn't do enough, and you dial it in off that. Um I don't know if you want me to go more in depth on that, but I just kind of want to give a, a broad overview of how you can begin using that percent fresh percent fresh test uh, from the from a coaching standpoint. Well, yeah, I, 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 I got questions. Oh, go ahead, sorry, Bart. <laughs> so you're talking about their workload their and and we talk about rate of perceived exertion, or you know, if you're throwing for this amount of time at this intensity or whatever. Now you've got a quantified result response your body's responded to that workload with this and you can say hey that was the response i wanted or that was too much and now we're now we're actually slowing our gains because they've got to recover now for much longer um or that wasn't enough and we're slowing our gains because we're not pushing them hard enough and so so i can take these before and after this exams and see the response that my athletes happening compare it to the actual workloads they're doing and customize their training to get the maximum performance over preseason, during the season, whatever, whatever you need. Exactly. Yep. The, the one thing I wanted to say on this topic is that, you know, we're talking about how examining the response to workload 
is so much more impactful with with our device. And, and some of the listeners might not know the difference between what's at, currently out there and what we offer. And I think, Bart, you put it in a, in a great uh, analogy is that a lot of the workload information that's coming, it's like measuring cars over a bridge where they're measuring how many cars are driving over the bridge and the weight of the cars in terms of the intensity of the load that's coming over the bridge. But with our method, we're really evaluating the state of the bridge. We're getting the information in terms of the internal capacity of the body to handle this load, which we think is really uh, vital because the external load really doesn't matter if um, we don't know the state of the bridge. We need to know what can be withstood um, by the body. And, And so I know Jordan's talked about percent fresh. We're working on better ways to involve lots of uh, factors involved in making decisions. Right now we're using certain KPIs, but even understanding how the athletes responding from their subjective scores, you know, how they're feeling um, related to uh, their training, how how, their body soreness, their arm soreness, their sleep, you know, and in computing these measures with the percent fresh strength is going to give us real accurate information to say, you know, this particular pitcher should reduce their pitch count by 30%. You know, we'll be able to eventually create safety ranges. Right now, it's very open to interpretation, but um, we're getting to that point. And I I really do believe, you know, the more advanced coaches um, that are out there are going to run with this thing. And the, the other coaches that might not be as well informed, we're going to eventually be able to give you the insights you need. So, and I... I keep thinking of a tweet we had a while back where we talked about the fact that AC using AC ratios to design programming could be could go the way of the dinosaur if you're actually using the response that the actual athlete is having their strength their as you were talking about the bridge they were looking we want to know what the actual integrity of the bridge is and not theoretically guess what it's what it is because we know how many cars went over the bridge or whatever. Um, we want to know what the actual strength of the athlete is and not theoretically guess because they threw 40 pitches. Right. Right. We want to get to a point, and, uh, you know, Jordan and I have talked about this a lot, is we need to get to a point where it's dynamic. You know, when coaches lay out a program, and obviously, you know, you want to have a template, and we've created our own templates for an off-season uh, training program that – you know, we feel is, are very strong, but we need to make adjustments to those things because we don't know what's going on with the athlete on a given day. They might not be eating well. They might be on a hu- huge amount of stress. They're not sleeping. You know, some of them are studying for exams and we're putting out throwing programs and we might have a high intensity day that this athlete is really not registering uh, enough force, enough strength. So we need to be able to adjust. And without this information, we may be overextending the athlete. And on the same side, you know, we may be having such a watered down approach to their training and their strength is so high, we're under training them. So we have to get at this dynamic optimum, you know, and and that requires, you know, understanding their fresh strength. And we usually do our fresh strength for pitchers on, on their bullpen days. Um, and if it doesn't look good, we extend that to their game days because we want to ensure that the strength is recovered. Um, or, you know, we, we also need this post throwing information because that also tells us and we haven't talked about it is how we look at pitching efficiency. You know, and I've done a little bit of research on on strength loss in, in pitching and, and what it can mean if you're moving differently. But, you know, if we're not accurate. If the pitcher is losing accuracy and they're getting fatigued, there's something that's that's happening where they're not efficient and we need to make adjustments for those things. Yeah, just to to jump on that, too, is the percent fresh is there's some outings, you know, 85 pitches is not always 85 pitches or 90 pitches or 105. Just because you did that, you know, we'll, we'll put it into a college context. For instance, if your Friday night starter throws 85 on Friday and then seven days later he throws you know 85 again but one of them he comes out of that game he's like man I am I am toasted he was always having runners on now you can actually quantify if there's a difference in that strength loss because so many people just go oh it was psychologically tough well what impact does that have on the physiology aspect of it where does that put your strength at is that more taxing from a physical end as well you'll be able to quantify that for the individual and know exactly how to program that coming week. 
Because just to even get ahead of it and even leapfrog, now all of a sudden, say he has that really psychologically stressful and it turns out that's a 13% strength loss as opposed to his normal 6% strength loss, now you can program in the next six days leading up to that next outing. He doesn't need to throw the same amount in that next bullpen. He doesn't need to throw two long toss days. You can adjust on the fly to make sure when he rolls out there again next Friday, he's back to a full gas tank. And you're able to use that with a fresh test, knowing how much strength they've lost over the course of an outing, over the course of a catch session, to really dial that in. And you can't do that just by looking at AC ratios alone. Because yeah. all that's going to tell you is it could come out, it was the same exact stress over that whole course of the outing per throw. None of the averages changed it. None of the range of motions changed. But it's just different. You know, when you're pitching with, is is you hear everyone talking, oh, he had traffic. He was pitching in traffic, which runners on. You're always holding runners. You got guys stealing, a lot of foul balls, whatever it may be. Those are different with the way your body's going to respond. And there's a lot that gets missed when you only look at AC ratio. It's, it's cool, but I agree it could go the way of the dinosaur because I think there's a better way to do it. And I think if you're looking at strength loss as well as where they're at, in the micro and macro cycles of it, you're going to get a better picture of what's going on. Uh, yeah. Tell me if you think I'm, I'm crazy on that, Ryan. No, I think you're, I think you're spot on. And, and another thing that, you know, we, the, the way that we do this is you, obviously you're doing your per- percent fresh test after the outing or after a high intensity throwing day. And then we got to do the fresh test on the bullpen day. And for the, you know, the strength staff, the medical staff, these individuals who are involved are going to understand what's the recovery process that they have for the athlete. You know, for instance, if we have this decline on the percent fresh and then on the bullpen day, it hasn't restored to the regular fresh average. You know, we know that something has to change in the the recovery process. So, you know, we've, we've talked significantly about the pitching side of things from, from the pitching coach's perspective, but this whole multidisciplinary team, you know, the athlete strength coach or the athlete's medical staff member, if they have them, they have to be on board. And um, if you don't have them, again, this goes back to the pitching coach. If strength isn't returning, we, we need to look into some things. We need to be able to evaluate, you know, is it is it sleep, nutrition, um, hydration, are those things, you know, not being met? Uh, is the athlete doing enough soft tissue work? So it's going to put us in our mind that we need to do something for the athlete. And again, if the bullpen te- test is, is not showing good strength, it's probably a good idea to think about what's going to be my adjustment um, to the bullpen and what's going to be my adjustment for the next game. And it's probably a good idea to test a fresh test again before the game you know, it only it only takes like three minutes. Um, it's isometric that you can determine on the day. Hey, you know, his strength's recovered. We're, we're in a good place because where I see injuries happening is that there are too many big jumps. You know, so, for instance, like if a, if a pitcher throws 65 pitches, one out and gets banged around, comes out and the next game you give him 105. That's a big jump. So we need to know that the strength measure, if he's going to go back to that, um, high level of performance, we need to understand that the strength is where it needs to be um, because you're going to, you're basically going to roll out uh, a, a Grand Prix race on a car with bald tires, you know, and that's, that's not what you want to do as a coach. To, to give a real world example that I'm laughing just because it's, there was a, <laughs> there's a guy that I was working with, he's playing in pro ball now. He just graduated, finished his, he had, he had to come back because the COVID season, so he got an extra year of eligibility. I uh, was playing at a Division One school. He's a reliever, and you know he was getting used. You know, like pitching on Friday, pitching on Saturday. You know, getting warmed up. The coach liked to have the guy ready to go all the time. So he was getting used. And in his mind, he's doing his strength testing, and he goes, "Man, I'm I'm losing a lot of strength over the course of a weekend, and I'm only throwing like two innings." And he's in his mind, my coach always has me loose. I need to be stronger. And this is like two weeks into the season. So in his mind, he's grabbing like 35-pound dumbbells, doing waiter walks for like a mile and a half. He's just going out to the track and doing waiter walks with like 35 pounds. He's like, I got to build more stability. I got to find a way to – and it's just making his strength get worse and worse and worse. And with all the right intentions, he's doing everything wrong. And again, I know I'm laughing about it. 
but we were able to use the fresh test as well as just the general, hey, look, you were at 115 pounds on Tuesday after you took a full day off. By Wednesday, you're at like 86 pounds. Like you can't even can't even brush your teeth in the morning because you made yourself so tired that you're going to be able to tell when a guy's overtraining. And again, with all the right intentions, it's not always that he needed to add stuff in. We, we were able to reach this guy and say, look, you actually needed to dial back because you're so overtrained that you're not allowing yourself to recover at that point. And he's dialed in on his nutrition and everything. So I know earlier I said I don't believe in overtraining. This is the one instance I believe in overtraining, so I'll take that back. Uh, so we had to use that information to be like, look, we need to manage your recovery on a day-to-day. Just because you're fatigued doesn't mean you need to build strength right now. You need to maintain the strength you already have as opposed to continually rolling out there on the bald tires. You just need to change your tires. That's all it was. Um, but you know, just a real-world example of it, of how you can use that to identify why is someone not recovering. And then you can dial it in from there and get really specific. So, yep. Jordan, uh, I love the real-world example. I, w- I want you to give me an idea. You're working with uh, – uh, what? Let's say college. Maybe maybe we can give an example of, of pro as well. What are you telling them in terms of when they need to do your standard um, fresh test, and when are you when are you doing a, a post outing or post event test um, during the week? Like how often are you doing these things? So <clears throat> for my starters, I like my starters to test on their bullpen day after we've got a baseline, after we've got all that information. I like my starters to test on bullpen day because I know what they're doing before they've touched a baseball now. Where is your strength at? And then I like them to test as soon as they finish their bullpen. And we have the quick exam. I have them do a quick exam or just simply click the fresh test. And you run through the fresh test, and now you know exactly if there's a strength loss, if strength is the same, or best case scenario, they've actually gotten a little potentiation out of that. And we know we can increase that throwing, throwing, throwing volume the next time. Um, and then I also like to have them test after their off day. So for a collegiate player, that's normally on a, on a Tuesday morning. They're, most teams are taking Mondays off, so I like to have them test on a Tuesday morning and then the day of their bullpen. That's kind of my ideal world for the collegiate player. Uh, for, the, for the pro starter, I really like doing it on a bullpen because that's going to give you every fifth day. And then from there, you can easily adjust moving forward. In relievers, regardless of the level, I like every 72 hours at the least. If they want to test every 48, I think that's better. But at a minimum, I think every 72. Um, Ryan knows all the the big words to give more context to that, and he can probably give a little more. Mine's a very uh, on-field friendly approach. Ryan probably has a a better actual schedule for that because he loves making schedules. Yeah, I I think – what you have is, is correct. I mean, ideally, you know, minor league baseball where we've experienced the the player development side is that usually relievers up until the double a triple a level are pitching every other day. You got enough pitchers that, you know, you're giving them recovery. Um, so you can, you can do this 48 hour schedule. Um, but most times relievers are going to be up two times in a row. Um, in the higher levels of, of pro baseball and in um, probably higher levels of college too, where we want to uh, use that 72 hours to test them. We can't go too long without a test. Um, and it's a, it's very chaotic in relievers, but if we get more data, we kind of, we'll get a basis of where they should be at. And you know, if their strength is really dipping, they might not be very good going back to back. You know, if you're having, uh, obviously if you're having poor outcomes with them, back to back um, and they're fatiguing a lot and may take, you know, you as a coach to realize I can't use this pitcher that way, you know, and the other, the other side of things too, on that 72 hours that this guy really hasn't had any strength loss, you know, especially at the higher levels, more mature athlete, you, you have them go a third day when you need them, you know, so there's, there's a lot of use for um, our, the relief model uh, and, and Jordan, I think we discussed if, if they have a really poor bullpen test, their fresh test is really po- poor on the bullpen. It probably be a good idea to do uh, a quick test on the game day. Right. I mean, a lot yeah, of people so... are going to be, they're going to be worried about um, fatigue and obviously I'm a strength coach. So I don't, I never think isometrics are that fatiguing, 
um, holding a position and pushing. But it'd be good to know from your pitching point of view, you know, how you feel about that. Yeah, Dick, there's there's kind of two questions in there uh, that I, I got. And for me, it's if that volume is down on the bullpen day, or not volume, that strength is down on the bullpen day, cut your volume. If a guy normally throws 180 to 200 on his bullpen day, he doesn't need to do that. Like, what are you gaining off off that? Just cut the volume. If he normally throws 30 or 35, cut it down to 15 to 20. Cut the volume. Or if he's dead set that he needs to throw 35, shorten up the catcher because that's going to lower intensity on that, and you're going to be able to help him self-regulate to where now we're lowering either volume, load, frequency, intensity, or the duration of what's going on, and we're able to recover that athlete. And then just like Ryan said, it's really important to get that fresh test again on the day of your outing. Because now you know how recovered that player is. Did you get him back to a full gas tank? And you're going to know how that guy's recovering. And from there, you can really start dialing in. Instead of going 90 pitches that game, maybe he needs 75. Because is that game really the one that you need him in? Or is it going to be the one in you know two months from now that's the postseason? And if you've done your job developing, you shouldn't have to rely on your starters every day you roll out there to have to go a full pitch count. And that's where the whole aspect of development comes in is like, you know, you want to make sure your bullpen's ready to handle those loads when a starter's fatigued. And if you save the bullets on the start of that day, now he's going to have more bullets, better recovery for the week after. And then he'll be able to save the bullpen and flip that, you know, flip the rolls around. But that's where the whole aspect of making sure the individual is developed to the best of their ability is going to help to make sure your entire pitching staff is developed to the best of their ability. And at the level of college I was coaching at, I know Ryan's called it, you know, the Ivy League of the West Coast at Vanguard a lot of the times <laughs> is, you know, we we used it especially going into the postseason was if we had a lead in the sixth inning, like we, we had enough confidence in our bullpen, like our starters knew, you get us to six and we're going to win the game. If we have a lead, we're going to win the game. And it was pretty much 100% of the time we were winning that game. And we had some big arms. They pitched up in AAA. A lot of guys who you know played AA baseball and things like that. We had a good recruiting class on that. But we knew we couldn't always rely on our starters to win the ball game. We wanted them to get the win, but we needed our relievers to be developed well enough, to throw enough strikes, to have enough velo, and to be durable enough to handle needing and go back-to-back days or pitch multiple inning outings. Because then when you roll into the postseason, that's when you rely on your bullpen. Because all of a sudden, instead of playing playing three or four games in a week, now you're playing five games in a three- or four-day period in a regional, and you need your guys ready to go. So you don't want to overtax your starters early because you need them to pitch more in the postseason, and you need your bullpen guys to be durable enough to help your starters out. So that's kind of like a long, roundabout way to answer that question of a fresh test and understanding like it's more than just what the starter's doing. You have to look at your player development is a group as a whole. And then to go into the isometrics, if someone's getting fatigued from an isometric work, there's something they shouldn't be pitching to begin with. If pushing on something with no movement is painful or if it's hurting, you need to go see uh, some kind of medical practitioner because I've never heard of anyone hurting themselves without moving. That's a tough thing to do. Usually to cause joint issues, there has to be some kind of joint movement. And in every single one of the tests that we're doing, I love starting my guys out. I just call it the basics of of training. Like you better be able to support your body in an isometric position because if you can't support yourself in an isometric position, you're not strong enough to pitch. Because think about the stabilization of the lower half is all isometric. And if you can't handle a hamstring bridge for 30 seconds, 40 seconds before your throwing program, you're just not strong enough to throw when it comes down to it. So we really need to, a lot of groups demonize, in a sense, isometrics. of Well, we don't want the guy to be tired, as opposed to going, if he's tired, there's something wrong from doing, even if he does 15 minutes of isometrics from starting feet, working all the way to fingertips, if that toasts your guy, you need to have a talk with your strength coach because something is off in that conditioning program. He is not ready to go to, go to post. And soapbox. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. Any chance to bring up Vanguard, you do, which is perfectly fine. Well, Ryan, Ryan was, I saw it in his eyes. He wanted to talk about him. <laughs> so high school, um, you know, these guys, uh, well, what's the minimum in terms of testing 
that, that we should be doing in high school? I mean, for me, the minimum would be if you can't get in a post pitching strength test, you do need to do a weekly fresh test. You know, you really do. You really have to see where you're at on, in, in the week. Um, you know, and I'm really concerned about the high school athlete. Out, out of all the injury research that's out there, the high school athlete is exploding. You know, between the ages of 15 and 19 years old, there is just an absolute exponential rise in elbow injuries, primarily shoulder injuries. They're not uh, escalating as much, but, you know, we don't want to lose observation windows. And my, myself and pro ball, I mean, we had we had a lot of kids that are around, you know, the teenage years, uh, you know, they can sign as early as 16 years old in the Dominican Republic. Uh, we bring them over to the U.S. side, some of the, gr the really good ones at 17, 18 years old. The strength can change a lot in a couple weeks, you know. And so if you have a weekly test, you can get on addressing it right away. You know, you don't have to you don't have to wait. So that's my recommendation, at least, you know, once a week get a fresh test in. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree generally with that. I think once a week is the minimum. I think for a high school athlete, because they are growing, they're different almost every day. You know, they, they could go through growth spurts, you know, their bone structures aren't, aren't fully solid. They're still growing. You know, I think Ryan, you said the, with the elbow itself, what was the age when that thing fully solidifies? Yeah. It's like, it's, it can be, it can be as late as 19 years old in throwing. Exactly. Athletes. And yeah. for me, I look at that and I have my high school athletes, generally they go Monday through Friday. There's not a lot they're doing on the weekends for the most part. That could change now that the COVID season could have some different restrictions for, for this coming high school season. But I have them test on a Monday because I, I like them to take Sundays completely off. And then I have them test on a Saturday morning because now I know how that work week for what their high school had them doing and then anything they're going to have me program in as well, we can know how taxing that was. And ideally – over Monday through Saturday, we'd like to see a minute they're the same or ideally a tick up in strength. And if they're not, we really need to address what it is they're doing. And maybe they need a deload week, maybe with schoolwork, with everything else going on, maybe they're multi-sport athletes as well in high school. I think I don't think you can test too much when you're in high school because, you know, man, you're 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 in the middle of growth spurts, you're in the middle of the worst nutrition of your life. You're in the middle of some of the worst sleep of your life, and you're also oftentimes playing multiple sports. So the better insight you can have on where that player is, the better off you're going to keep them healthy. So for coaches out there, I'm just curious, how much of this are you explaining to the player? When you see changes that are going on and you're saying, hey, we're going to adjust your volume here, I want you to do that, are you trying to educate the players that they could eventually be doing some of this themselves or is it more of a black box and you're just, and I'm sure player to player, it probably varies a little bit, but what, what's your goal there for them understanding what you're doing and why we're doing this? I mean, I want me, them to know fully. Uh, go yeah, ahead, Ryan. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, Jordan just, just said it is, you know, I, I want them to be fully aware. You know, we want, we want to get to a place in health and performance sports science where the athlete is very autonomous when the technologies are very good, the reporting structures are good, you're, you're telling them the what, the why, and the hows of their monitoring, you know, what you're seeing, why it's important, and, and how you're going to address it. And, and you want to, as a coach, constantly be an educator. You know, there's nothing like being in the dark that, that can, you know, create a rift between the athlete and the coach and, and a gaping hole in player development. So I'm all about you know, explaining, making sure they are fully aware, you know, they understand the, the programming directions, you know, athletes should be asking why they should be asking their coaches, why are we doing these things? And you have the evidence to support it as a coach. Um, it, it just makes the buy-in a lot faster. Yeah. One of the things I've always told, told my guys is when I start to work with guys, I want them to, in a sense, have a master's degree of understanding themselves not necessarily understanding someone else's program, but understanding what's going to work for them. And I, and I tell them, I'm going to wade you into the shallow end. We're going to get into the deep end. At a certain point, we're going to take the water wings off and you better learn how to swim on your own. So the better you educate that athlete to understand their information and understand how to do their own programming, 
the less is going to be on your plate as a coach in the long term. And if you're working in a program, and again, just because Ryan brought him up earlier, you know, with Vanguard University, <laughs> is I was really big on highly informing the players on why we were doing things. Because now my seniors are teaching my juniors, my juniors are teaching my sophomores, my sophomores are teaching my freshmen. And when my freshmen see a senior screwing up, they're policing and making sure that, you know, Big Brother is doing things correct. And when you create that culture, that everyone knows what's going on. Why do we do A? Because B and C. And why do we do D? Because A, B, and C. And everyone knows the what, why, and how of what we're doing. It creates that buy-in. And now the only thing I have to do is show up and just make sure that guys are there. It, because everyone else is policing themselves. They're doing what they need to do. You create that atmosphere of accountability, and it makes your life so much easier as a coach to where now it's not micromanagement. I don't like to micromanage. Ryan, you've worked with me. You know I like to give a lot of power to the players. A lot yep. of people hate that about me. Oh, well, it is what it is. I'm okay with it. If someone dislikes me because I try to educate the player, I'm all for it. That's my whole viewpoint is make sure the player knows because now that player is going to teach another player, and now your job as a coach is just to write a lineup, and that sounds pretty fun to me. Awesome. Well, I want to – switch gears a little bit here and let's just get into we've said there's going to be strength changes and range of motion changes over the course of an outing pre and post what's actually happening that's causing these changes ryan what's going on yeah so you know there's a lot of things a lot of aspects i think first one of the things that i think is a problem is that blood supply goes down so when when pitchers pitch so they've done studies that they've shown up to 60 pitches from rest, blood volume increases. And then after 60 pitches, the blood volume in the throwing arm, it starts decreasing. And then um, within an hour post-pitching, the blood volume in the arm is actually less than the baseline. So blood volume goes down in the throwing arm. And I think that's a problem because they're, lo they're losing uh, nutrition. There's probably temperature changes that occur. You know, there's there's lots of those things that can add to these changes, but you're also getting some contractures that I believe happen because of some micro damage. You know, the mus the muscles and the, the soft tissue is trying to protect itself. And so, you know, we call that contractures. There's some restriction in the tissue that that doesn't allow you to get the full range of motion. Um, so those two things, I think, are, are really uh, big pieces of why we're seeing strength changes and we're seeing um, uh, range of motion changes. And then you got you got some metabolic aspects, like you have all these this this muscle tissue that's requiring nutrition and it's it's exercising. And then you know we know that lactic acid does not build up in the body, so we know that there's really no increase in lactic acid in pitching, which is what people think in the body. However, there's there. I don't think there's been a study that's actually done a muscle biopsy over the course of a game, taking mu muscle tissue out of the pitcher's arm to see locally, is there an increase in lactic acid? Where I do feel there are some chemical uh, components to what we're seeing internally in the muscle, where it just doesn't have the ability to to contract and to be able to set up, um, you know, the the proper mechanisms for shortening the muscle and putting towards force. That's to me, that's really interesting that you get you can do a certain amount of workload and, and the blood flow is actually st staying stable or going up. And then all of a sudden you kind of hit this wall and things start to deteriorate really quickly, it seems like at that point. So, I mean, that goes right into the everything we've talked about, you know, that that pitching while fatigued is, you know, the number one, you know, predictor of injury and number one cause of injury there and and why you might see that in the early part of the season when kids aren't ready and they're out there and they're throwing way beyond what they should be doing and, and, and those type of things. Um, and so that's the blood supply. I know I'm looking through the notes here. You're talking about inflammation as well. And, and let's talk about the next step there and how that, how that impacts things. Yeah. So, so inflammation, there's, there's three particular processes. You have inflammation, which is a change in temperature, color, there's swelling, there's some fluid that's that needs to be evacuated from the tissue. So that's the stages of inflammation. Um, and, you know, the important thing to note there is that 
the time course is dependent on strength. So there's been studies to show that, you know, relatively stronger uh, athletes have a shorter inflammation window. And, uh, you know, when you're getting swelling and you're, you need to evacuate fluid from the muscle and you need to rebuild tissue, you know, the slower we are at that, that's going to, I'm sure, show up in these strength changes, you know, and obviously in, in range of motion changes because you, you got extra fluid in the tissue and there could be some pain. There could be some soreness with it. Um, so, you know, that's an important com component in considering, you know, how to recover the body. Um, and, and we need to we need to consider inflammation with our nutrition, you know, again, sleep. The athlete's not sleeping very well. Most starters, and you can talk to a lot of starters at the big league level, there's not very many of them that before an outing, they sleep really well. They're really amped up the night before, you know, they're going through their head and their game. They're, you know, it's, it's like a big exam. They're thinking about their um, approach to the game um, and all the data they get. And they, they usually don't have great sleep. So you got to think, OK, this could put the inflammation state in a bad place, you know, post pitching. So, you know, after that, that post pitching outing, we need to get into a place one to get blood flow back into the arm. Um, and two, you know, we need to we need to lessen this inflammation cascade because it's got to go through those three stages. So. You said inflammation window. And that sh and strength shortens the inflammation window. Is that the same as saying it leads to a faster recovery time? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, stronger athletes. I always say stronger athletes are harder to kill. You know, that's kind of the the euphemism I use, and and it, and it should make intuitive sense. You know, you have stronger tissue; it's harder to break it down. I th I think there's also a lot of confusion when you're talking just from a baseball st standpoint. When you said a stronger athlete's harder to kill, I would agree with that 100%. I think strength is going to be one of the key characteristics of why someone has durability throughout a season or over a career. But I think where people get confused is they confuse strength with endurance when it comes down to it because you have guys that go, oh, well, he can you know, do – you know, this specific band program five times and that, but it's a training thing. And you look at the amount of reps that go into some of that and it's hundreds and hundreds of reps into a specific training program. And that's an endurance based program as opposed to what strength is and throwing is a weird mix of both, but the, the individual throw itself is highly strength dependent. But the course of pitching over a game is endurance dependent. So do you think that there's any confusion between those two terms and why some people, in a sense, get a little bit opposed to measuring strength, specifically in the throwing arm? Yeah, I mean, it, there's there's this inconsistency. We test strength, but we train endurance. And, you know, the athlete has to have a suitable amount of aerobic capacity. So you got to think between their pitching um, outings, they're usually they're pitching every half inning. They're they're sitting for eight to nine minutes. You know, physiology, knowing the energy system they use, they use a very short window energy system. You know, delivery is usually less than two seconds. And uh, you know, when they're sitting there, they they should be in theory recovered from passive rest. So you know, the conditioning level is very important, but the arm we need to have maximum strength in the throwing arm because that that is what creates our power you know and our maximum strength is what's able to handle um these high speed stretch responses you know um in endurance when we talk about endurance training like every day they're throwing 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 should be considered a method of training you know and they're throwing more than they do anything typically um so they are getting endurance work for their arm and, and I feel where we're really missing the boat in the high performance state of baseball is there's really not a good concept of strength, even amongst the coaches. You know, some of them we talked about strength is a new language and we, we need to get that language. We need to translate this um, so people understand this is a new way that we need to look a, uh, about our athletes and, you know, understanding their readiness and understanding how they're going to function competitively. So. Let's pull that into talking about efficiency. We're going to take that strength and let's move into pitching efficiency, mechanical efficiency. What, what? I think we need to touch that a little bit more. I know we've had a couple blog posts and some things about it. Um, it 
can be a little confusing at first because we're talking about some different things. So I know this is important to you, Ryan. What What's your take? Yeah, I mean, Jordan and I have talked about it a, a, a while. Um, just looking at the research, like I, I allocate 5% of injuries to biomechanics. And if you look in that small sliver of, of how movement, um, and I'm talking in a, in a high level athlete that's throwing at high velocities. When you look at that small sliver, I would associate that half of that is a result of faulty coaching. Okay, so if we're asking the athlete to change their movement and we don't have a good understanding of how that affects strength, you know, um, we could be exposing them to risk. So when we create an efficiency rating, we have to have some anchor to know when to make that change. And we're looking at accuracy and we're looking at strength loss. You know, if an athlete doesn't have strength loss and they're highly accurate and especially they don't have pain it doesn't make sense to go in and change the way that, de that they're delivering, even if it doesn't make our eye test, even if it doesn't sniff well in the biomechanical evaluations that they have. You know, I'm a biomechanist and I see a lot of problems with biomechanics where people are using data and they're making changes, real, you know, large changes to an athlete because they think they need to be in a certain range, you know, and then they forget about what can happen to strength. And if strength gets affected by a poor coaching choice and the athlete compensates and their their bodies are being stressed in a different way that their strength isn't being able to match, we've now taken a coaching approach and caused an injury. So that's why it's important to, to evaluate efficiency with strength as, as a major component. Well, just to go more in depth on that, it's not even so much that if it changes strength, I think a better way to phrase that, tell me if I'm wrong, is you can change a guy's stride angle in a matter of a day and you're not going to change his strength in 24 hours. So if all of a sudden that guy is normally at X Newton meters on his elbow and you change his stride angle, whether you open him up or whether you close him or you shorten him, and all of a sudden that goes from X to X.5 and he throws 85 throws the next day in a game doing that, the strength is going to be the same. If someone can increase strength in 24 hours through a program, that's pretty impressive. I've never heard of that being done, but I do know you can increase stress on an elbow in less than 24 hours. So if the strength is going to be the same and they're used to X force and you bump that up by X.5 over 100 reps, you've done more harm than good on that. Um, I think that's a, a little more clear way to phrase that unless you think I'm way off on the point. No, I think you're right. Um, you, you can make changes in loads really quickly, you know, and you're right. There, there's a little bit more of a time constraint in terms of yeah, how to see Yeah, because I mean, loss. I've been trying to get over a 135 bench for 27 years now, <laughs> you know? So strength yeah. just doesn't happen. I don't know what the deal is. That's I, right. think, I think the constant message for us is that, you know, the biomechanists that are out there, the pitching coaches that are out there that are being led by movement data, you know, you need to have some interpretation in terms of how is this affecting the internal world of the athlete? And the easiest place to start with is strength. Is this athlete losing strength more because I've asked them to change some global mechanics property? Um, that could be a problem. And then as a coach, you can also understand, did you make the right decision? Is the athlete getting stronger? Are they retaining more strength post outing? You know, to me, that's more an efficient delivery than anything biomechanical. So let me ask you this question. So, you know, I'm a coach and I see something that biomechanically I think is is wrong or even inefficient or even dangerous. And I'm making that change to basically lower the stress or my reasoning is that I'm going to lower the stress um, that's, you know, that's going to be happening during the throw. Am I essentially wrong that that any change, no matter if it's in the good good direction, is going to have some more stresses on the arm in the short term while while your body figures that out, or or what's going on? Because obviously I can justify I'm going to make this change and it's going to help this help this kid. Um, you know how and you're saying hey you guys need to be extremely careful. So I want, I want you to talk about. Yeah. Talk about that. Yep. So let's go back to the, the bridge and the car analogy. So what you've done is you still have the same amount of cars that are driving over the bridge. Okay. So still the throwing volumes are around the same, but now the weight of the cars are less. 
So we have we have less what we think less stress on a, on on the bridge, but we still don't know what's going on with the bridge. That's a physiologic response. We're looking at the expression of physics, you know, looking at Newton meters and looking at all these different quantities of force. But we have no idea without strength testing what is going on with the throwing arm. And, and to me, that's a big issue. Whether whether you make a great change, uh, you know, and, and you, you notice, yeah, he's, he's throwing what we think are, is biomechanically more efficient, you know. We don't know from a strength perspective, is the athlete physiologically efficient? And, and that, that's, the, that's the paradigm we're, we're stuck in. And I, I see it in this world. We're, get, we're getting closer and closer to having, you know, many people with a global understanding of biomechanics. But we're getting away from the most important attribute in sport performance, and that is strength. We need to understand that because of this particular case scenario that you've given Bart is that, you know, we're going to have people that are going to look at their data and say, okay, my decision was effective because now there's lower loads on the arm, but they're not going to know if the strength reduces. The same loading could be just as bad as the higher loads where the athlete didn't lose strength. So that's an important feature that we need to understand. We need to have a collective approach to the athlete and know what strength means. Yeah, you bring up a global understanding of biomechanics, and I think there is, just with everything that's out there, there is a better understanding now of biomechanics from a general sense than there was 10 years ago or, man, even 20 years ago. It's way better. Uh, even over the last five years, it's way better. But for me, what I see, is you, as you said it earlier, is they want these people to fit a mold or within a, a safe range. But in reality, that those are just averages when you're taking people, and I'll just talk about stride angles because that's always a big hot hot button. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a heated debate no matter who you're talking to. Is you'll see guys that stride open, you'll see guys that stride neutral, you'll see guys that stride closed, and everywhere in between that. And everyone wants people to stride neutral, but in reality, you don't know that person's femur length versus their tibia. You don't know whether their hips are inverted or everted or neutral. And all those things are going to impact how they stride, how they move down the mound. So it's almost one of those things that you see from my experience when a coach or coaches or a group changes that stride angle, you almost always see force drastically spike. And then you always see command suffer as well right along with that. And then in a pro setting, that player gets released really quick because they can't get anyone out and they don't have enough time to get themselves hurt when it comes down to it. And they go, oh, well, you know, he just wasn't going to get anyone out as opposed to, you know, building strength around that position and maximizing how their body moves naturally. Uh, there are certain things in biomechanics that are going to naturally occur. And there are certain things that you do need to coach up. But understanding the difference between those is really important. And that's probably a whole, I know we're talking about percent fresh tests, uh, and you know, that's a whole nother, another topic in itself that could probably take five, six, seven, eight hours that we need to carve out a week to go over. Um, but that's the other thing too, with biomechanics is we have so much awareness, but I would still say there's not a whole lot of understanding and there's not one pitching coach that I think has all the pieces to the puzzle. Uh, but one guy that pops up is uh, he's in Bart's neck of the woods, Randy Sullivan, and I've always known and in, like intuitively from the from the person I mentored under who was Tom House that stride angle is unique to you, and I thought Randy did a good job of saying, well, we don't know how that guy's pelvis is designed, so if you take a guy whose pelvis is designed that says he should be across his body and you open him up, you're hurting that player, or if you take a guy who's open because his pelvis says this is how he should stride and then you close him up. You're hurting that guy. And then that made a lot of things go, okay, that's what the guy I mentored under said. This is what my experience has said. And then here's some tangible information to go along with it to where it kind of ties it all together under a nice little package. And that's the big thing is we do have a huge, I just call it an awareness of biomechanics, but I wouldn't say the understanding and the application is as readily available as the information, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. So... We've talked about a lot of different things here. Um, 
you know, started out discussing acute and chronic changes and, and how we now have the ability to actually measure those and impact um, and customize training um, based on that. And that's, that's really exciting. I think, uh, I think everyone agrees there. Um, as we wrap this up, any final thoughts? I mean, for me, uh, I'll say it time and time again, strength matters most. We need to have, you know, our listeners, the community, the, the baseball community, the throwing community in general, we need to be able to evaluate our athletes with a lens of strength first and everything else is secondary. All right. Well, listen, uh, another great show. If you haven't subscribed already, please do. Please, if you're on YouTube, hit that like button, do whatever else um, you need to do to um, make sure you don't miss any new stuff and, uh, and let people uh, know that we're out here and we're giving this knowledge. Take care.